that's where Ashley comes in. <clears throat> I, I think most of the world, Ashley, you might agree, assumes the Taliban are just simply against humanitarian groups. We've seen lots of attacks on NGOs, but you know your your research uh, suggests it's it's not so simple. And and I think it's really quite intricate what the Taliban, how the Taliban approach approaches humanitarian groups. I lived there for years, and I had no idea about some of these specifics. So tell me, you know, what is the Taliban's stated policy uh, on, on access or negotiating with humanitarian groups, and, and what's the reality on the ground? Yeah, as you say, it's incredibly complex. So I'll try to, to stay out of the weeds and, and give you a bit of an overview of, of what we found, which was that the Taliban has a sophisticated policy, at least at the leadership level, in their code of conduct, which Pascal mentioned, Often armed groups have their own internal codes of con uh, conduct, which are, you know, lay out their own internal rules on these things and are a, a starting point for any humanitarian agency seeking to engage. So what does the code of conduct for the Taliban say? Well, it says it has a, a shadow ministry of sorts that regulates aid agencies. So we talked to the, the shadow minister in charge of, the commissioner in charge of regulating aid agency access. And he laid out a policy of registration of agencies having to pledge not to spy on the Taliban, uh, to share their project details, to be transparent, to be accountable, to agree to be monitored by the Taliban. And this was a policy that was fairly wide, widespread and, and widely known on the ground by at least mid-level commanders and fighters, which I, in fact, found surprising. As you suggest, Nick, there's this perception that the Taliban hates aid agencies, their symbolisms of you know, the Western intervention of Afghanistan, which they're against and they're seeking to drive out. But as with many armed groups, there's an interest, a competing sense of um, suspicion balanced by self-interest that the Taliban have. So while they may distrust aid agencies, while they may not um, agree with what many of them represent, they also know that if they are to present the, the credible face of a, a government in waiting, they have to be able to govern. They have to be able to provide services. So of course they look to aid agencies in an effort in some cases to co-opt them, to bring them to the areas or at least enable them to work, to give a positive impression to the local population, to win local support. You know, see we're better than the government. We're allowing education and programs continue, we're bringing jobs to the area, um, and all of these things. So, so it's incredibly, incredibly complex. And on one hand, you have this attempt to co-opt or to use um, aid agency activity to, to further the Taliban self-image and, and positive PR. And on the other, you have extreme violence towards some aid agencies. You have retribution. You have aid workers being targeted, executed as spies, for example, or being blamed for airstrikes or night raids executed by international forces. Um, but I think it is important to acknowledge that there have been some things that the Taliban has done, namely polio vaccinations. Um, and this has been the most successful uh, public example of humanitarian negotiations in Afghanistan, whereby various UN agencies and the ICRC undertook negotiations with the Afghan government, as well as the Taliban. This has been going on for years to ensure that all children could be vaccinated so that polio could be eradicated in Afghanistan. And I think they've made huge strides to make that happen, and in large part due to the Taliban, who has repeatedly issued press releases uh, stating their support for polio vaccinations and, and urging uh, mothers and, and fathers to get their children vaccinated. So again, incredibly complex and at times contradictory. I think, I think Tony, we're going to come to you in just a second, but I want to ask Ashley one follow-up to that, and as I think it's important as we think about this whole issue. So we have on the ground a local commander uh, in some village or some area of Afghanistan above him, some kind of shadow governor. The Taliban at least uh, publicly states that they have a real hierarchy here. So you're talking about uh, humanitarian groups figuring out how to get access. Fundamental mm -hmm. question, how do you know if you're negotiating with the right people? Well, I mean, I'd love to, and, and I just put forth a picture of the Taliban, which looks very organized. But as you know, and as, as anyone who's been in that context or similar uh, 
contested context. It's nowhere near that organized. Um, armed groups present these structures, but the degree to which they function on the ground is variable, and it varies over time. It's incredibly dynamic, um, and it will shift. And so I think what's really important for aid agencies is to have that on the ground intelligence, if you will, or information, to really have a strong presence, to really spend time and resources together, coordinating together as aid agencies, but also to, to understanding these armed groups um, and having a really sophisticated understanding of structures they, they publicly state that they have, but also how they work on the ground. In the case of Afghanistan, what works in one province or in one district of one province is going to be different in the next district or the next province. So the information has to be incredibly, incredibly local. And I think what you often find is um, aid agencies don't have the resources or don't have the time to devote to you know, the sophisticated analysis required um, to engage strategically on these issues. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Uh, let me bring Tony in.